Hey, what's up? Lee Ron here. Thank you for joining me in today's video and it's going to be all about Q&A. So I'm going to answer your questions. I went over the YouTube comments, filtered them by questions, went for the last four weeks or so and I'm just going to answer a bunch of them. I have 20 questions here. We'll see how uh, long it takes to answer this amount so that I know for a future video because I plan on doing more of these just to get a lot of questions answered real quickly and hopefully we'll get to some interesting topics. So feel free again to drop me questions in the comments and once in a while I'll try and consult them. It's even faster than typing and I think it can lead to more detailed responses. So sit back, relax, maybe have a drink or something and we'll get started. So uh, Sujanith asks, how do you know uh, such subtle things in art? You must be introspective all the time. Do you have a checklist at the end of painting to analyze what went wrong? Um, so it's a good question. I think the whole like Understanding, understanding the subtleties is all about practicing. The more you paint, the more these subtleties will make themselves a little clearer. Um, it's not really about thinking con consciously after finishing a painting. I barely do that, to be honest. Um, I just look at the thing and, and, and in a very dry criteria. I think about what I like or what I dislike about it, what I think I did right and what went wrong. Um, just very generally where I feel like the realistic impression isn't so good or if the goal was different when I, where I feel like I messed up uh, a goal. Let me rearrange this a bit. Um, so this is kind of how I approach this. Sorry for the shakiness. Uh, there isn't really a lot in terms of being too introspective. I will say this, if you keep all your paintings, you don't throw anything away, you have a chance of going over older pieces and really it sticks out, the mistakes you made, the things you were inexperienced in, and it's by definition things you won't notice while you're painting because you don't you like the perspective in the long term. But when you're looking at stuff from like half a year ago, a year ago, five years ago, this is crazy, uh, you really get to see immediately the things that were basically invisible to you back then. Um, so that's I think how you develop it uh, and how you can see kind of a um, maybe have a documentation of the entire process. Okay, hope that makes sense. Uh, next up by Triveni. Hi Liron. Uh, so do you stretch the paper? If so, that requires wetting the paper and taping it down or do you just use the store-bought paper as is? Excuse my English, no worries, it's very understand. I understand your question perfectly. I don't and, and I wondered if I should keep this question in or not but it just shows no matter how many times you explain something there's always going to be people, people who haven't watched that particular video and I don't expect anyone to watch all of my videos, though I do know some people do and thank you so so much for that. Um, so, so I don't mind re-answering questions again and again. I don't stretch my paper, never ever. I use it as it comes from the store. I know there are some advantages to it. Unfortunately, I can't comment too much about the technique of doing it because again, I don't do it, so I like that experience. Uh, I do think there are a few great videos about it, so if you just search for YouTube, I think even Steve Mitchell from The Mind of Watercolor has a great one on it. Uh, Deborah asks, can you please uh, tell me the best non-animal hair brush to use. In my personal experience, I really like the silver black velvet. To be honest with you, I'm not sure now that I think about it if the Escodas are... Uh, yeah, Escodas have synthetic ones, so I'll go with that. Uh, but you need to make sure that it's, it is indeed a synthetic one because they do have natural hair as well. And silver black velvet are synthetic. You can find the three packs on Amazon. Really good, really good kind of bang for the buck. They're not too expensive. Um, I've been using them for the first maybe three years of my watercolor journey and they're great. So I'd recommend them. Fairly cheap too, again, great value for money. Money, Liron, you are a great painter and teacher. Take it from someone who has taught art and painted 40 to 50 years. How do you stay so humble? Um, that's an interesting question. So I just, I stay humble because I, I know I'm not, there, nothing justifies me not being humble, if that makes sense. I mean, I, I know I have a really long way to go and maybe it's a part of that perfectionism or always striving for a better result that is also a bit unhealthy because I always see the, the better things I can achieve and the more th the, the better results, better uh, engagement with the process, better focus uh, and more skills to build. So I don't really have a reason to, uh, to not be humble, I guess, but I think also some of it is just personality kind of a thing. Um, I think the way I communicate naturally is that. So I don't, I don't think it's necessarily like an achievement. Uh, maybe it's just my kind of uh, default psyche and that's how I operate in the world. And I think it does serve me well. Um, I think if you compare yourself to like the best in your field, it humbles you. 
and watercolor humbles you every day and if you compare yourself to the most beginners or worse if you want to call it that way but people who just get started you can see the long way you come so you're kind of in the middle there is no real reason to think that you're the best or the worst you see that it kind of gives you perspective it's like getting comments that are very positive on videos and getting comments that are very negative sometimes um, the vast majority is positive but it's like you don't really want to let either of these affect you too much because um, it's, it's it's all about like you can, can dive real deep into psychology but I think it's about not identifying with that external thing because you know yourself and you know who you are what you're worth hopefully um, and if you're a person that you're worth uh, you have uh, some kind of self-worth right just on the merit of that so I'm trying at least not to identify with uh, either like the really good comments or the really bad comments or the really good stuff people say about me or the really bad not, like outside of work and, and just in personal life too um, I find that it's it's always uh, kind of a, a a bad thing to do it it's just not productive it's not it doesn't help you at all um, so yeah that's my take on it I hope I answered your question somewhere in there uh, we have a question by Lynn hi Leron from Lynn in California where did you go on vacation so yeah, it was Georgia or Georgia I'm not sure how to say it properly the country not the state not the US Georgia the country in Europe beautiful place really weird bizarre uh, kind of experience because it's really a mix of old and new um, but yeah I had a great time took a lot of good pics for painting so that's always good uh, next up we have Sarah thank you for this demonstration a lot of it is is comments on videos obviously uh, thank you for this demonstration it sounds like a great uh, course talking about the upcoming course I'm going to do on uh, painting realistically and values uh, will the folder of reference pictures include already posterized versions I do not have a computer or Photoshop do uh, my printing at FedEx so yeah I mentioned something in the last live stream about um, how I want to create this big folder of reference photos for you like a library of reference photos that I think are useful and good uh, and they'll be open to everyone at first I was like I should do it with the upcoming course but then I went back on it and I'm like I'm just gonna create something for everyone where I can dump all of my reference photos the ones I don't intend on using for finished pieces so you can use them for whatever you want um, and to answer your question, yes, I will include already posterized pictures because I do see the value in it. I think it is uh, important. And if I can do that work for you, why not? And I already have those versions for most uh, most uh, photos I have, so why not? Uh, and yeah, I know a lot of people don't really want to mess with technology or don't have the tools. Um, so yeah, I will have like the original, maybe a desaturator, a bird just flew, like jumped up for the window, it was weird. Uh, the original desaturated, mean black and white, and um, uh, posterized. I will try and do that. Um, Marina asked, can you legally do that? And that was in regard to creating a sketch based um, Oh yeah, and I missed the question, I'm going to go back to it. Um, uh, it was in regards to creating a sketch version of a painting based on, on someone else's painting. I created a sketch like I recently did with the Joseph Zbukovich uh, painting, or even I think it can be asked in regard to using other people's paintings in the Painting Masters uh, show. So to address the Painting Masters thing, because I do get that once in a while, there is such a thing called fair use. Um, the basic principle behind it, as far as I understand it, is am I taking away from the person's income or am I not? Meaning, am I in competition with them? So, if I were to take a painting by Alvaro Castanet, print it on mugs and sell the mugs, I'm obviously making profit off of someone else's work in a way that takes away from their value because they could do that. And it's not my piece of art. But if I show someone else's work and talk about it and never claim it to be my own and talk about it in a review, or as a teaching tool that falls under the category of fair use so it is a teaching tool um, and and to take it even further the definition if I'm not mistaken again it looks at it as is the new work transformative it, does it add something new upon the original one or is it just derivative meaning it's the same and then you took away from the artist what I find is when you follow fair use very often you'll end up not only not taking away from someone's income but rather helping them because if i review someone's paintings i'm putting more exposure on them so more people get to see their work and that's the key here so i think the painting master series a lot of artists contacted me and they're very happy to to be there and some people ask to be there and i look at their art and it's really good so i i end up featuring them so i think it not only not take away from someone's income but rather improves it um now when you're talking about recreating someone's painting as a sketch 
as long as some people are so like I look at local Facebook groups and they're like you can never create an artwork based on another who says that I mean I can create I can recreate uh, someone else's painting as much as I want and in fact I encourage you to do that with my work for teaching and learning purposes okay I'm not gonna take this sketch and sell it probably <laughs> like I mean I won't even though it could be considered transformative I'm not sure about that but I'm, I'm not I don't intend to sell it so it's not like I'm gonna take this work and sell it or do something like this use it for a product or anything like that it's just for teaching purposes which makes it perfectly fine do I take away from Joseph's book which is profit when I sketch his painting? No, I actually put more awareness on his paintings and then people who weren't familiar with him, which are very few I guess, um, find out about him. So I'm not taking away, I'm actually helping. So that's that's the way I look at it. Uh, question from Catherine. Hi Leron, I'm taking your frustration, <laughs> you wrote frustrated with watercolor, but it's frustration free watercolor of course, and I'm loving it. How do I find out when you're doing the live YouTube presentations? I'm kind of old and some tech things elude me. <laughs> it kind of regards Kate. Yeah, so this is a question I get every once in a while. I think your best bet is to go over to the channel, hit the bell button, and I, again, I have to answer it because a lot of people ask this, they miss the live stream. Um, you hit the bell button next to the subscribe button to get notifications. You want to make sure you get that. Now what happens is when I go live, you'll get like a, a notification on your phone or computer or wherever. Um, and, and maybe also possibly on your email and then you do that now to backtrack a bit you don't even have to do that I generally live stream every Thursday same time 9 a.m. Eastern time I do plan on doing a few surprise live streams like if I'm in the middle of a process and I just want to do like a silent stream or I turn on the camera let you in on what I'm doing and but not in a performance kind of way but rather just me working and giving you the option to see the work in progress when I'm focused on it um, and for that you will need notification because it's gonna be a surprise live stream so go to the channel next to the subscribe button you should have a bell hit the bell and enable notifications and you should get one once I go live but generally every Thursday 9 a.m. Eastern time um, riser X I'm having a hard time rotating 3d objects and making them look like a 3d object what should I do so for this I would say first things first start with very basic objects so you want to start with a cube um, and you want to start with the easiest, I actually have one here, let me show you, you want to start with the easiest angle which is going to be like front, something like that. And you look at the, use an existing cube as reference if you have one, so something like this. And what you want to do next if you have the real cube is rotate it a bit and redraw it from this angle and rotate it a little more and redraw again and again and again and then try up and down try all sorts of different directions until you feel comfortable with it and then you can invent it yourself I do think you ask the question in the context of um, I do think you ask the question in the context of more complex shapes so I would say backtrack a little do this for um, cubes not boxes by the way not elongated cubes I want you to practice getting the lines of equal uh, this uh, equal length so for example right now this line looks appears to be shorter than this line because it's moving away from us but I want you to want to develop an understanding of what it looks like from different angles and how to draw this line shorter to create the illusion that this line that that it's going away from us right like this dead on center these three lines are the same length but if you do this a bit of this line disappears and you see more of these two so I want you to practice that with cubes with cylinders it's a great shape to practice and then and only then work towards more complex shapes there are actually ways like mathematical engineerical ways of doing it in a more dry way but I want you to develop that instinctual understanding of a cube in every angle and I do this every day let me show you just yesterday's um, anatomy session started with me practicing cubes in different angles before working on torsos wait a second let's see if you can can you see the cubes so I do this every single day uh, I really do and if I'm doing it now you should definitely do it if you're getting started uh, funny girl do you still use sap green since you have other colors to mix it up easily I'm asking because so many use it and name it in tutorials but I never want to buy too many different colors at once so it's a little long uh, but that's the gist of the question uh, what else can one do uh, with it in the pure form 
Uh, so yeah, uh, what you can do with any color in the pure form is just practice like filling in areas, practicing your brush marks, stuff that is, is very de general. That's what I use the more obscure paints I'll never use for a painting. So instead of using my French ultramarine, which I run through tubes of, uh, I'll use like an obscure color I don't care about for that kind of a practice or just to practice doing an even wash or a gradated wash or blending edges or, and all of that good stuff. Um, so that's a use. Now I don't use sap green as much as in the past. I only use it for specific areas where I want a lot of green and I, then I use a bit of blue and yellow to make it more unique but for the most part most of the paintings you see I use just the three primary colors blue yellow red whichever secondary colors they create I use so the orange that's created by them the purple and the uh, green so no set green for me most of the time and I think that's kind of a natural progression for me um, the more I do this the more I'm like okay I'm gonna let go of these pre-mixed colors and just use three for simplicity's sake for color harmony and if I want to add one more in maybe in a certain area I will but it makes the whole process much easier more fun quicker uh, Kushinairu asks hey I had a question of what I see in the reference photo the cars are silver but uh, but you went for blues and reds and browns what made you choose those specific colors and also how to make out which color to use uh, and also in the video and uh, this is referring to a video I did of a park close to where I live and you see a couple of cars in a row they're gray in the photo and I kind of exaggerated the temperature uh, and also in the video uh, of an interior house painting of yours the reference photo had purple entering from the window indicating sunlight but you went for a totally different set of colors but still achieved as a sense of reference of the reference photo uh, can you elaborate on these please yeah so there are from my own experience there are two factors that are responsible for something having that that gist of the reference photo and that gist of realism basically it's the values and the shapes if you get the drawing accurate and you get the value right like Stan Miller always says if you, do, if you haven't watched his videos you should um, you will get a, a result that that has that spirit of the reference photo it's just gonna look like it it's gonna look realistic or kind of similar to the reference photo sometimes the reference photo isn't realistic too even though it's reality because it's edited and so on so if you do that you will get the gist of the reference so where do you have room to play in with the temperatures okay and the way i like to achieve glow and there's going to be another question on glow um is using the the combination of value and temperature but to answer this question uh why did i use blues and reds and browns because i enjoy it and a lot of it is subjective and you decide what color to use the best advice i can give you is to experiment and see what you love um, but a lot of the beauty comes from a combination of warm and cool so use both blue and red to figure out where to use each of those and how much that's up to you in experimentation uh, i can't say the the exact ratio because it's also just what you want to convey so it's your choice in other words um, but the reason i use these colors is to create a more interesting painting um, for example i actually have a painting here to show you um, or maybe I'll, I'll maybe i'll edit or maybe i'll forget Basically, sometimes when I follow the, I'll, I'll explain it in words. Uh, sometimes, when, or should I just rotate the camera? I'll just rotate. It. Let me show you. Okay. So, do you see uh, this this one, right? So, this painting that I did a while ago, and hopefully you can see it well. Um, let me zoom in a bit. Let's see if I can figure it out here. I don't normally use this camera for these videos, but this painting has a bit of a more muted color scheme. Yes, there is a bit of blue and a bit of orange, but for the most part, it is gray. Now, very often, you'll find that you don't have these strong colors in nature, uh, strong blues and strong yellows. Uh, reality is more gray than you would think, and the subtlety comes from the difference, and it's all within the context of a scene. If a certain scene has... Um, a lot of gray in it even the faintest yellow will pop out more uh, so it's all within the context but I like to exaggerate the temperature just to make something more interesting and more um, more colorful because I like colors and it's fun and and I don't enjoy mixing the exact gray I find it super boring so it's a combination of all of these but a lot of it is subjective go for what you enjoy let's see that I didn't miss anything in this page yeah okay uh, so we have another one by Sujani. Uh, is it true that as an artist we tend to avoid painting subjects which we are not confident in? Like I avoid cityscapes, cars, people for example. If I'm not confident in landscapes I tend to avoid plein air painting. I might lean uh, towards more cityscapes than plein air too. 
It is true, and it's a big mistake I think most people make. Uh, I would encourage you to go beyond uh, the subject. So what I mean by that is learn to enjoy to paint the light and shadow, the colors you see, the shapes you see. If you take a step back, you'll have the same shapes in a cityscape and, and, a, and a landscape, because what kind of shapes are you gonna get? Vertical and horizontal lines and diagonals. You have all of these everywhere. Yes, some scenes have a little a bit more squares and perspective for a cityscape as compared to a landscape. Yes, that is true, but for the most part, if you break it down to the simplest forms, you have a lot of commonalities. So what I would suggest is try and really enjoy the beyond the subject. Don't enjoy just painting landscapes. See if you can enjoy painting cityscapes, even if you get them not as accurately. Um, besides, you do want to work on, I think I want to personally work on the things I'm weak at, so I am trying to tackle those. Like for me, florals are really hard. So I do want to tackle some of these subjects. Uh, or very specific textures zoomed in is very hard for me to do, but when I take a step back and I can see the light and shadow clearly, it's easier. But why should I just do what's easy? I want to do what's hard as well. Um, so two things. One, you want to improve your skill, go for those scenes that you're not as confident in. And two, try and see beyond the what is there and look at more like the light and shadow and what you can love about that. Maybe there's a beautiful strong contrast in the landscapes that you're used to but also in cityscapes and then you can use that as the main idea of the painting and still enjoy it. And that's a big part I think. Now if you can enjoy a certain concept then it goes beyond the a specific subject okay and try and do that. that that's really good if you can get to this point you'll get to a point where you can just grab an object and paint it and have a good time uh, so yeah YC asks so what if my first layer is not wet any enough anymore but I still want to use wet in wet technique can I salvage dry paint so yeah this is a common question I get let's say you do wet and wet but it's dry but you want to do more wet and wet what you would have to do is let it dry I wouldn't mess around with dry paint too much unless it's a very small fix, like a, a highlight you want to lift. And then what you do is pre-wet over it once it dries and do wet and wet on that as if it was the first layer. Now it's hard because the paper's already been used and, and the, the fibers are tangled up and so it's a bit harder to execute the technique, but it is possible. And if it's a good paper, it is possible to some extent. So yes, you pre you again pre-wet it and then do wet and wet on top of that. That's my advice to you uh, about this. Um, I wouldn't touch dried paint unless you know what you're doing and it's a very specific fix. Funny girl, do you have your paintings on display somewhere? Just as reference of your style, I mean those you sell. Uh, yeah, sure. Go to lirongallery.com. It's just one word, lirongallery.com. You can see what I consider to be my best paintings there. Those are the ones that I put up for sale. Um, so there aren't a lot of them, maybe like 20, uh, something like that. Uh, but this will give you a good kind of indication of what I believe is my current style. Jeffrey, how do I paint the landscapes, particularly making green vegetation glow, like I see in uh, the sunset on pines? Yeah, so it's a bit of a tricky one. The glow thing is, uh, I would say, two factors. It will be um, the value, and then it will be the color temperature, but the color temperature is in the context of the rest of the scene always even the values are in the context of the rest of the scene you can take a scene and make it overall lighter but as long as it's relative like the the dark turns into a mid value and the mid value turns into a light value as long as it's relative the relativity stays between the dark and light the gap the delta stays the same you will get a a, a glow as well or kind of a similar um similar effect if it makes sense okay so basically it is about the value and the temperature but both of these work in a in a contextual way how it works in the the scene in its entirety okay uh, now as for the value if you put light against dark you will get a stronger um, kind of glow but sometimes things are darker than they seem and if you go too light you lose that sense of glow. So for example when you look at these pines in the sunset they look super light. What you'll find is they're not white. They're actually very light green or mid-value even green. Greens tend to be darker than people think. When you turn a photo black and white you suddenly see how dark the green can get. So I would say if you try and get the accurate value or contextually the accurate value and use the right color you will get that sense of glow. So for the m most of the time it is a mid value of a yellow greenish color in that specific regard uh, when you see these beautiful uh, check out Paul Talbot Greaves's work he's really good Paul Talbot 
T-A-L-B-O-T, Greaves. His work, the green there, the sap green or may green, whatever it is, is so good and glowy. And that's an artist to study from. Take his paintings, turn them black and white so you can analyze the values more accurately and go for it and see what you can achieve. These works are so glowy, I love them. Uh, but yeah, it's a combination of both of these factors. Uh, Terry, thank you for this, Liron. I was wondering, is it okay to connect the mid values and the darks in one wash to unite them and then add a glaze just to the dark areas? Or is it better to do them in three separate steps? So basically, do you paint the darks and then the mid values and then the, the lights and then leave highlights? Or do I cover everything that's not a highlight, then paint over it what's mid, -val what's mid value and then what's dark? It really is up to you and different processes will lead to different results. Some are smoother, some are not, but some are more, um, more graceful and some are not, and that's fine. I think it's a matter of taste in that regard. Let me show you. So this painting I did, and I shared it here on YouTube uh, like a few days ago, by the time this video is out, I painted the darks and then the mid values, and then, I, and then the light, I kind of went all over the place here. I didn't uh, start with one or another. I kind of painted the, the shape that I wanted to paint at the moment. So you can do it either way or a hybrid approach, it doesn't matter. The only thing you need to pay attention to is if you start with the darks and then you paint next to them a lighter wash, just make sure you don't rub it or scrub it too much so that they don't reawaken existing washes. That's the only thing to have in mind. And look at it, look at it here. I painted the floor after doing the darks here of the cars and it's perfectly fine. As long as you don't scratch it too much with the brush, you just put the glaze over next to it, you should be fine. So yes, it is a matter of choice. If you paint different sections or you start dark to light, the result may look a little more fragmented, but not in a bad way fragmented like I say to try and avoid. It just you will see more of the individual shapes. If you go for covering everything up with a mid value and then covering just the shadows with a dark value, the result may feel a little more flowy or a little more unified, but then you have to be more uh, attentive because it's harder to figure out what shapes to draw because you're basically you're painting a consolidated shape. But if you go just one shape at a time, yes, less flow, a little more fragmented, but it's easier to get the right value in the shape you're working on. So I'm just throwing a couple of ideas at you so that you can decide which way you prefer to go, okay? Uh, so yeah, um, NYC. Rocker, why would you squeeze fresh paint out of the tube and then let it dry in the palette? Isn't the point uh, that you want it wet to be able to move it around? Beginner questions, because I'm, I'm a beginner, no worries. Um, yeah, that's, that's actually a great question and it's very easy to forget uh, the, the simpler things or the things I do without thinking about them, which it's a good refresher for me. So here's what I find. In this palette, I have a lot of paints that I squeeze from a tube and then they dry. What I personally find is when a paint from a tube dries on the palette, it is still easier to reawaken compared to a paint that came in a pan. Very often that's the case. Now there are some pans with paints that are very soft and easy to reawaken, and there are some tubes with paints that are very hard and, and tough to reawaken. So it's kind of a, you see, you get what I'm saying? But generally speaking, for most paints, I find that when they were freshly squeezed from the tube, dried, they're still easier to reawaken on average. Okay, now another reason for this is it's just more cost effective using tubes. It's cheaper than pens. So it's much better to even let them dry and paint the next time um, and, and, and use them as if they were pens to begin with because it's still cheaper. Okay, uh, now there is another element to it which is um, sometimes you don't know how much paint to squeeze out. So I squeeze out a paint even if I don't think it's much even if, I, if I, even if I think it's not much and then I get left, uh, a bunch of paint is just left here after I finish the painting, then what will I do with it? I'm not gonna throw it out. So I just use it the next time, you see? So it's a, it's a mix of a lot of factors, but overall, yeah, I do find it still, if it was squeezed from a tube, it's gonna produce results more easily and it will reawaken more easily. Maybe that's just my imagination. Maybe someone can, uh, can dissect it and, and tell me I'm wrong, I don't know. Um, one more thing to have in mind, if you are gonna paint a large painting, like a really large one, anything that's like half a sheet or a full sheet, uh, it is better to use freshly squeezed paint. Uh, even if, uh, it, even compared to freshly squeezed paint that dried, it's better, especially compared to that, it's better to use it freshly squeezed, so either like squeeze small amounts and use them up and keep squeezing more and more, um, 
or just go for it and maybe use it for something else later, maybe transfer it over to a pan later if something is left. But I do think, yes, for larger pieces where you need to mix a lot of paint fast, fresh squeeze is the way to go. Um, Sujanith, another one. Hi, Leron, did you find your genre or style in watercolor? Yes, it's not necessary to find, but just curious to know what process unfolds one style. I actually have a video on it, on how to find your own style, check it out. Um, but I will say this, I feel like I'm at a point where I like where I'm at, but I'm aware of the fact that I didn't like reach enlightenment. There's a long way to go and I'm sure there will be many changes. Mostly what I find when I look at other artists is that you just become more effective in what you do and the result gets more interesting and more personalized and better overall. If you look at some of Joseph Bukovic and Alvaro Castanet's older works, you'll be surprised at the place they began, even with a decade or two of experience. They've come a really long way in the last decade or two and you can still see the difference uh, to this day if you look like a couple of years back. Um, so I think I still have a long way to go and I love it. It means there's potential, um, but yeah. Check out the other video for like how a style evolves. Uh, I did talk about it or I did also a live stream on it. Uh, so yeah, Anna, been trying to learn to paint since lockdown. I love, uh, I love it and skip, I'm not sure what you meant here, but it's making me sad. Do you think I can actually learn if I have no talent? Uh, that's a that's a that's a immediate mark for me that because that's a that not a lie but it's it's false. Uh, anyway, I love your work. It's amazing. Forgot to add, I'm also older. Is it too late to learn? So thank you so much, Anna. And my approach, and it's a good question to end on. There is no such thing as talent. The more I do it, the more I learn. It's all just hard work. It's like and I showed it visually in in like a live stream. So let's say there is like a natural. Um, um, What's the word for it? I keep forgetting it, but like you're inclined or you have this natural approach to something. So when you're a kid, someone is this good at it and you're this good at it. So look at the gap. And when you're a kid or when you're young, the gap looks like this when it's actually like this. What I claim is there is this long of a way to go. So let's say someone has a, a bit of a head start over you and then you both improve and improve and improve and improve because th this person has talent. You both improve and improve and improve and improve and improve and, improve and you're here now. So they're here and you're here, or maybe you surpass them. But maybe let's say you're here and they're there. Look at how irrelevant it is to where you started, okay? So talent is overrated, talent, I don't know, I don't know to be honest with you if it even exists. I think that learning things at a young age may be easier, but that doesn't mean you can't start now and get beautiful results and, and always compete with yourself and become so much better than you were. Now, is there a time when it's too late? I don't know if you're 100 years old, maybe it's, it's too late to get to a certain level, but you can always take the brush and paint. You can always do that. Even if the result isn't good, you can always have fun with it. You get my point? Um, but most people like, even if you're, I don't know, 50, 60, 70, if you have a decade or two or three to go, hopefully, you can do it and you can improve at it. And I really do believe, the more I do anatomy studies and the more I get really deep into the whole gesture drawing, figure drawing, I realize that those beautiful works you see of, of very skilled artists, it's just skill. Uh, they sat down from the age of five and painted every day because they loved it. Yeah, maybe that's, that's another factor in it. Maybe if someone naturally really enjoys it, so they end up drawing all day long and yeah, that, that happens. Um, but there, there isn't really something like talent. There is wanting it. If you want it, you can get it. So that's my two cents to end uh, this video. Uh, feel free to just drop questions below. What I do is, again, I go to the YouTube uh, comments. I look at all of the comments and I just filter by questions and unanswered. And then I'll just take them all out, print them again and do this again. I think it's the quickest way. It's, it's quicker for me than to write them down manually and think about them and have like 10 or five sometimes. I did Q and A's with like six questions and dove really deep. Here we got to th through 20. I don't know how long the video has been running, but I think we did a good job. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this one. I can do many more of these. Let me know and yeah, we'll talk to you again real, real soon. There are a couple of changes that I'm making just as a final note. I'm gonna try something different in terms of how I work and how I divide my week. So one week is gonna focus more on business, another is gonna focus more on business and content, and another is gonna be pure art. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna test it out and we'll see. So next week is actually more content and business and working on my products and doing more all of that. And then another, uh, the next week is gonna be pure art. And I'm not gonna put any pressure on myself to share content or anything like that. It gives me a full week to just work on art. So we'll see how that goes. We'll keep you updated. Thank you so, so, so much for watching. Much appreciated. We'll see you again real soon.